Yeah, my name is Cristina Solana and um, I'm originally from the Canary Islands, which are Spanish. I first came to the Forest of Thing in the summer of 1990, when I was halfway through uh, my university degree, because I, have heard, I had heard that um, there was a community that was providing an apprenticeship on organic horticulture, which is what I wanted to do at the time. So I just came for a short visit for about three months. And it was great. I loved it. I obviously didn't see much of the first of thing. I mainly was immersed in the community, which is in between Blakeney and Newnham, Oaklands Park. And I spent my summer there and it was absolutely fantastic. So I left. I went back home to finish my degree with the idea that I will be back. I was one of seven children. I was the baby of seven. So life was really exciting when I was a child because there was always a lot going on and Franco died, so that was I experienced first-hand the transition from the dictatorship to democracy. And my siblings were all very involved with that. They were all very politically active. And I, I remember like absorbing all that, like sponge, observing that and watching them and hearing them and listening to the discussions at home and all that. It was, it was really fascinating. I think that was really, really formative for me that you know to witness that uh, that part of the history of, of where I came from through my siblings' eyes. That was, that was a strong influence in me. So I knew I wanted to get to know the islands really well before I left. So with my friends from uni, we travelled and walked each one of the seven islands. Obviously, with the weather being so good in the Canary Islands, we didn't have to carry tents or anything. We just had a rucksack with food, clothes and a sleeping bag, and we could just sleep anywhere. That was brilliant. So that gave me a really good knowledge of the place where I came from. By the year 1994, I completed my studies. And as soon as I finished, I, um, I came to the forest and lived in the community. And it was all a big, a big adventure, really. It was very exciting. Uh, everything was new. And uh, it, was, um, it was just exactly what I wanted to do. We were basically training to be gardeners while taking care of people with learning disabilities. We were from all parts of the world and the residents were all from anywhere in the UK really. And uh, it was a really vibrant lifestyle. There I met uh, somebody who eventually became my husband. He is from Germany. And so when we both finished, he was doing the apprenticeship as well on the farm, whereas I was doing it on the gar in the garden. And then we decided to leave together when we finished. And uh, the opportunity came up for us to live locally somewhere else on a piece of land that had a barn that could be converted into a, a, a small house. It wasn't really a house. It was really like a chicken shed that we turned into a household of one room where everything was in that room. So we basically spent six months building that place. We called it the... Gallinero, which is the Spanish word for chicken house. It was fascinating because a lot of the material came from the community. So the floorboards, for example, had been the shelving in one of the larders in the community. So it was pure, purely recycling stuff that other people didn't want anymore. And uh, we ended up having a lovely, lovely little bungalow, I, would, I suppose, built by ourselves, where we lived for about two years, and then also there was a piece of land I could use to grow vegetables. And I started a small business growing organic vegetables and selling them to the local community. So at my peak point, I was delivering boxes of organic vegetables to 23 households. After two years of doing that, the opportunity came up for Peter to have a job as a farmer on a local farm, um, Rackman's Lane Farm, which is a permaculture farm in Lidbrook. So I started all over again from scratch, you know, ploughed a field that didn't have anything before other than grass and started again to grow vegetables there. So in a way I was trying to change the world on my own <laughs> by growing organic food, um, which everybody could afford, but meant I could not really earn very much. And at some point I had people saying, oh, I heard you, you're, you're Spanish, would you um, 
gave me Spanish lessons or Spanish conversations and they were thrilled. I felt like I was gold to them, you know, oh, a native speaker in the first of Dean. Let's go and see her and we have a Spanish conversation and grammar and lessons. And, and within an hour I was earning more that I was making from growing vegetables. So I thought, oh, okay, so I think I probably have to change the proportion of the different activities I do and do more Spanish teaching and a little bit less uh, living off the land, basically. And at some point during that period, um, a job came up at the royal, the former Royal Forest of Tin College. So that moved me to the next stage, which, which was I stopped basically growing vegetables for a living and started teaching formally at a college uh, for, you know, for youngsters to achieve the GCSE and A-level. Uh, I was getting, obviously, I was now in my mid-late 30s, but I realised I was running out of time if I was going to have children. So I thought, I said, OK, my biggest dream of all, really, is to travel around South America. So let's do that. Let's go to Peru, get that out of the way, because otherwise I'm going to have my that itch forever. And once I have children, I'm not going to be able to do it. We saved some money and then we went to Peru, spent a month hiking around Peru and funny enough I became pregnant while in Peru <laughs> so came back to uh, the forest of Dean and found out I was pregnant with a child that ended up calling we ended up calling Inca for obvious reasons I decided I wanted to stay at home with Inca I stopped all my paid work and just dedicated to the work that is required to be a mother. I mean, Ragmans was a great place to live in, but I was pretty much on my own with a child. And um, while Peter was working and earning the money for the family. So we had a discussion and we decided to maybe apply to the community where we had met and um, go back there to run a house together with our daughter. And um, we applied to the community to be house parents there so that we could continue having the lifestyle we liked without me having to be isolated with the child. So we did, and they accepted our application and we moved there. This time we moved to um, the Grange, which is uh, part of the community in Newnham. And we ran a house, we ran a household there with... Um, five adults with learning disabilities while I was bringing up Inca. Well, and Peter was around because he was running one of the workshops. So it was great. That was fantastic. So it was kind of closing the circle, really. Having left the community, we went back where we originally met and we continued to have the life we wanted to have. Then I became pregnant for a second time and had our second child, a boy, and he was actually born in the community. Unfortunately, my dad passed away, and as a consequence of that, I inherited a little bit of money. Being sort of adventurous people that we are, we thought, well, what shall we do next then? So we decided that um, it would be really nice to go and travel a little bit more. So uh, we did that. We bought it. It was an amazing vehicle. It was an actual uh, Bristol VR double-decker bus. And when travelling with the two children around nine European countries for a whole year, their plan was that we would live like that uh, indefinitely. But we didn't have any income coming in and um, we ran out of money, basically. So after a year, we returned. And where could we return? Well, let's return, return home, which really is the forest. So we came back to the forest and um, we found out the community was in need of house parents. So it was really fortunate that we, they welcomed us back. And we stayed there for another year running a household and while we tried to sell the bus and get some money from it so we can eventually leave and have our own household somewhere in the forest. In terms of any challenges that I might have encountered to move, you know, from one country to another one, um, I didn't really have 
a big challenge in that respect because I moved originally to a situation that I was already set up. You know, I moved into a community that was already up and running. I only had to slot in, if you like, into a life that was already smoothly running. I didn't have to arrange accommodation. I didn't have to arrange income or transport, nothing. You know, I just came in as a volunteer and there I was. Off, you know, it was quite easy in that sense. And the community, of course, facilitated anything that I needed. So that was really easy. And then, obviously, when I left the community to have my own life outside in the forest, um, that was like starting again from scratch. But because I had already been a while in, in, in the area, I had some a network of connections and friends and contacts in the outside. People noticed straight away, as soon as I opened my mouth, the first thing that people asked me is, oh, where are you from? Because obviously I have a strong Spanish accent, even though I've been here for almost 30 years. I can't get rid of my accent, not that I want to, but it 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 means that it's the first thing, thing that people notice, is that I'm not from here, I'm from somewhere else, which I find a mixture of slightly amusing and slightly irritating, because to me that's not an issue, you know, I happen to be Spanish, but to me that's not the main thing about me, it's just, you know, incidental really. I, I had a colleague at work who said once to me that the main thing that people think about me is that I'm Spanish. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. You know, it it, it really shows that um, that's the first thing that people notice. But in a nice way, it's not, you know, it doesn't feel negative in any way whatsoever. In fact, people are always very, have always been very welcoming and warm. When they ask me, it's out of curiosity and interest, really, like, oh, what brought you here? And that kind of thing. So people have always been very warm and very welcoming. I never had any issues whatsoever of feeling rejected just because I don't come from here, but from somewhere else. Not at all. It's um, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's been really nice to to be uh, welcome here. So my life now is very different to how it was all these years ago. I now live in a rented house from a housing association, and I have a couple of jobs that um, enabled me to pay my bills basically so I uh, I live my, my husband and I eventually separated although we are good friends and he lives next door our children and I live in this three-bedroom house in St. Breville's and uh, I work as a teaching assistant in Yorkley school primary school um, and I also continue to teach Spanish another thing I do is uh, I love singing and then somebody in the in the local primary school in St. Breville School wanted to set up a choir run by the mums. We are called the Bella Mamas. We get, we are getting really involved in events in the community, and but, you know we can sing anything really. But it's all a cappella, and it tends to be quite uh, meaningful. Sometimes it's you know like um, could be sort of like protest songs or community type songs or world music. It could be anything really. And that is really fulfilling. That's really nice. Yeah. What I like the most about living in the forest is, first of all, without any doubt, is the forest itself, the woods. The woods, you know, going in it is my medicine. Whatever, whenever I'm in a not very good space, I go to the woods and I know I feel all right afterwards. It's so beautiful. I feel we are really, really lucky to live here. It's just breathtaking, you know, the forest. And also the history of the forest. You know, when I go around and I see, you know, all the mining, hist you know, you can see all the remains of what the history used to be. And, and I love visiting the scowls. And uh, it's just it's just beautiful. I, it's like, yeah, it takes, it takes my breath away every time. And I also love the the people, the people I've... Of course, there are all sorts of people everywhere. But the people I have happened to get to know in, in the Forest of Thin, I, um, I'm really fond of. And I uh, I find there's a, a lot of people who are very open-minded and um, alternative, if you like. So those two things together are the things I value the most, the people and the forest itself. <laughs>